got a little bit of time this morning. Uh, before we get going and, and talk a little about the agenda, um, you know, originally this was supposed to be a, a combination uh, talk here with me and Matt Suisse. If you're not familiar with Matt, Matt does an amazing amount of work in the memory forensics and, uh, well, forensics in general, incident response community. Uh, he was also called out by the shadow brokers. We were actually called out together. Uh, they correctly identified that, you know, where I used to work and totally messed up with Matt because I don't think Matt ever worked there. He's not even a U.S. citizen, uh, so probably not a good, uh, not a good match. But uh, Matt took it like a champ, uh, and he's been doing a lot of, uh, <coughs> again, speaking truth to power kind of things. That's what I was going to hit, actually, the truth to power thing, because Rob's not quite telling the truth there, right? Uh, he, says, uh, he says, yeah, and I appreciate that. But when I got in the fight with the White House and an official White House account started fighting back at me in January, we were together at a SANS event, and I assure you that Rob's demeanor looked nothing like it did up here on stage a few minutes ago uh, when that occurred. So uh, when the White House takes you on, that's kind of a... Uh, also, I was looking above for a drone strike at that point uh, any time we are outdoors. So, um, <clears throat> But anyway, Matt was supposed to be here. Uh, Matt, uh, unfortunately, couldn't make it. He had a big incident response piece kick off about three weeks ago, knew he wasn't going to be able to make it, uh, and we started shifting stuff around. So um, unfortunately, there's some stuff that I can't say up here uh, because of my background. Uh, that I was heavily depending on Matt to say, not because we coordinated anything, but I saw Matt's Black Hat presentation last year and said, hey, if you want to go and talk about some of this other stuff, that'd be awesome. And he's like, oh, yeah, totally. I'm going to hit this, 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 and this. And I'm like, that's outstanding, man, because I can just shut up and you can do whatever you want and good to go. So uh, that doesn't mean this is going to be a bad talk or a boring talk, just a slightly different talk than we were planning to have, uh, planning to have before. Uh, so who am I? I work with uh, SANS, obviously. I work with IANS, Rally Security, founder of Rendition InfoSec, uh, former NSA hacker, uh, master CNE operator. I hate people that call themselves thought leaders. If you have to call yourself a thought leader, you're not. Right? That's usually a pretty good, uh, pretty good start there. Crypto grows, absolutely. And if you needlessly add blockchain to a software solution, I will hunt you down. So <clears throat> let's talk about what are we going to cover. Um, I want to talk about the history of the dumps. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about why I think shadow brokers are targeting some individuals and not others. I have no doubt they have a lot more data than they've released already. Why should you as a digital forensics professional, I think this is the most important thing we're going to cover today, why should you as a digital forensics professional be studying these and other intelligence community leaks even when your boss says don't? Now I know this is a controversial topic, I've written on this in the past, I've gotten a lot of flames uh, coming back here from, uh, from that. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is a hill I'm willing to die on, uh, literally. Uh, but, uh, <clears throat> you know, again, a lot of folks here, because of their security clearances, because of where they work, because they have government connections, are told, don't go look at these dumps. They're classified data. They remain classified until the government declassifies it, even though it's on the Internet, right, uh, for everyone to see. You know, and I think those laws and I think a lot of those policies haven't caught up with, well, the digital age that we all live in today. But you should be studying these. I'm going to walk through a few reasons why. Uh, probably make a couple folks in here uncomfortable, that that's fine. Uh, I want to talk about the deeper implications of the shadow brokers dumps uh, in general as well. Yeah, here's what we're not going to cover. We're not going to talk about any classified information not already in the public, right? When I say not already in the public, um, <clears throat> for those that, uh, you know, have a security clearance and are super worried about this, uh, I will tell you I have a couple of screenshots from the dumps. So if you need to leave now, by all means, take off. Uh, I'm good with that. Uh, I won't confirm that these tools belong to NSA, right? I think other people have already done that. You certainly won't hear me uh, talking about that. I won't talk about why, <clears throat> what specifically I did for NSA or why I left. Um, I'm also not going to talk about who I think the shadow brokers are, because I think that's been well covered uh, by lots of other people and, and all that. So, Oh, wait. Um, so who are the shadow brokers? I know I said I wasn't going to cover this, but, um, you know, we start talking about who are they, right? What's the motivation? When we start doing threat intelligence and... I don't think Robert Lee is here yet, but he's teaching the awesome 578 course here this week, the threat intelligence course. And when we start looking at a threat, right, threat intelligence, of course, uh, certainly shadow brokers applies here. What we're looking at here is the intersection between intent, opportunity, and capability. And by the way, if you're trying to remember that, that's IOC, right? So as threat hunters, we all remember indicators of compromise, intent, opportunity, and capability. <clears throat> From a capability standpoint, there's no question that these folks, right, have some awesome capabilities. Either they've got a great insider, who's feeding them data, or they've got a way to get classified data out of uh, what should be one of the most secure places, I would think, on the planet. Uh, so so capability-wise, I think good. Also capability-wise, they've evaded capture uh, for, gosh, we're going on 18 months now, right? Evaded capture for well over 18 months, I guess almost a little bit more than 18 months, right? Uh, even with the full, 
even with the full power of the US signals intelligence community, the law enforcement community, et cetera, tracking these folks. So I'd say capability-wise, they're, they're probably a top tier, right? From an opportunity standpoint, hey, I mean, the internet's there, you can dump, rock on. Uh, from an intent standpoint, that's really what I like to look at, right? Is the, what was the timing of the dumps? Uh, when did those come out? What else is going around there? What were they trying to steal the media cycle from? I know a lot of people believe they're Russian. You know, I'm not gonna weigh in on this, but uh, anyway, so <clears throat> I'll leave that there. Um, I will say, as we start talking about the timing of the dumps, um, you know, as far as how do the tools get out, right? That's a question that I really can't answer. I do have possibilities, uh, you know, as far as insider threats. This is obviously a possible, uh, you know, a possible piece here. Um, I, I will say that I'm happy they've identified a leaker in the Vault 7 case. Uh, I don't know if anybody's following this. Uh, there's a gentleman in custody up in New York uh, who they've identified in the CIA leak case. Um, certainly, uh, there was some initial thought, I know among some folks, that maybe the Vault 7 and Shadow Brokers things were related. Perhaps they are, don't know, certainly. Um, but, you know, insider threats are possible, as we well know. Um, you know, it could be a hack of NSA's networks, right? Uh, you know, I'd love to believe this isn't possible. I wish, I certainly want to believe it's not possible, but it could be uh, in the realm of infinite possibilities. There's Hal Martin, uh, a gentleman who walked out of uh, secure facilities with 50 terabytes of data, right? So, I mean, I would step back maybe and think, is that data among the 50 terabytes? And, and, and my guess is that even NSA probably doesn't know, right? Um, I, I think that uh, at the point that you lost 50 terabytes without realizing it, I think it's very difficult to claim that you know everything about what was taken, right? I think that's a, that's a tall, uh, tall order, a large claim to make there. Uh, Kaspersky, right? And, and I'm not gonna put a tinfoil hat on up here, but you know, the reality is that we know uh, that at least one developer was taking work home, right? And, and if that was happening and nobody was catching it, I have to ask you the question, were other developers taking work home? Were other people taking work home? I mean, Hal Martin certainly was as well and was getting away with it. Uh, so, you know, when NSA or anybody else comes back and says, no, no, that was an isolated incident, my, my follow-up is, how do you know, right? And of course, they're never gonna answer that question. So, uh, could Kaspersky or some other third party, uh, antivirus type solution, uh, potentially Russian-based, have pulled back uh, some of those uh, files by, you know, hitting indicators of compromise there? So, <clears throat> kind of looking at the shadow brokers in the background here, I was actually on an incident response gig when the first piece got leaked, and I'll be honest, uh, you know, when I saw that out in the media, I. I was immediately concerned, right? I mean, like I think everybody was. And, and as soon as it started emerging, what was in some of those, uh, you know, some of those tools and exploits there that were originally leaked on August 13th, uh, you know, we, we saw some immediate exploitation uh, worldwide of some Cisco routers uh, and, uh, well, Cisco routers and firewalls specifically. Um, but uh, with SNMP deployed, that was certainly a, uh, that was certainly a bad, uh, bad month for us. Uh, we were working one incident response and that turned into lots of incident responses, many of those uh, fueled by, uh, uh, fueled by that. I have to say, by the way, um, you know, as, as much as I dislike the shadow brokers, and I really do dislike the shadow brokers, they have been great for the incident response community. Um, because for the first time, folks are, you know, everybody has access to nation state level tools. Um, and it is really upping the game. And we are seeing, I would say the majority of our incident responses over the last, uh, over the last year, right, have included some use of the eternal blue exploit somewhere in the network. Oftentimes, it's one of the ways that they've pushed in. Definitely once they're in, they're finding machines, MS 1710, uh, to go back and uh, to go back and knock down. So again, I I'm not gonna thank the shadow brokers for leaking all this stuff, I certainly won't say that, but if I have to find the silver lining in a given cloud, it is definitely that they have upped the incident response game. And I think overall, right, not to be cynical, I think overall this is raising the bar for security, right? Um, you know, again, as we have so many folks that have access to these tools, uh, what we're seeing then is a lot of other folks stepping back and reevaluating their threat models, uh, and basically coming in and increasing the security around their stuff. So we see, secure, or see a list of infrastructure servers come out in October. In January, we've got a list of Windows exploits and a few tools, right? They released 60 some odd tools. Uh, one of those was really interesting, and we'll talk about it here a little bit later. It was something called Event Log Edit, right? Which was kind of interesting, um, because for a long time, we've had a lot of assumptions about what we could and couldn't do with event logs, right? We could clear them, but we couldn't go in and start surgically removing, uh, surgically removing entries in event logs. And then in around April 5th, uh, Linux tools, uh, there was a bunch of Linux stuff that came out and a couple exploits, um, and uh, that was pretty cool. And I actually wrote a blog post about this. Uh, I hadn't been completely silent about the Shadow Brokers thing. Uh, you know, they were threatening a couple of folks here and there and threatening, you know, more release and more release. And 
And when they did this, with April 5th, uh, there was some other stuff kicking around in the world, and of course you can go Google that, I'm not gonna get political here, but, but it certainly looked like, from a timing perspective, right, uh, that this was a response to uh, largely a media headline kind of grabbing thing. And, and I was actually down at Sands Orlando, we were getting ready to kick off Sands Orlando there. And I think it was day two, day three, something like that, I went to sleep uh, after having written that blog post. It got syndicated a few places and whatnot. And I woke up uh, and I pulled up my phone and I look and there's a little Twitter notification thing and it taps out on the Twitter app at 99. It says 99 plus, right? And I open that and then I see that I've been called out by, uh, well, what is likely to be a hostile nation state here, uh, the shadow brokers, right? So my phone is at this point, not only do I have the Twitter hits, I've got, you know, dozen signal messages, you know, I've got call, missed calls from, uh, you know, two people I work with. I've got um, several missed calls from my PR guy who is like losing his stuff. Uh, from, uh, well, because I mean, he's getting called too. He does PR for my company, all right? And so I'm like, oh, this is not good. Uh, so <clears throat> anyway, uh, that made for an interesting conference, definitely, right? I was actually teaching 760 out there, uh, exploit uh, or advanced exploit development. So this worked in really well, the fact that they had dumped a bunch of exploits that uh, we could also look at. That was cool. Uh, but <clears throat> that said, right, as you start looking at these Windows exploits, of course, you know the history here with Eternal Blue. I'm not gonna walk through the WannaCry and not Petya and the dozens of other places that MS1710 has been included in. But I do want to talk about the deeper implications of the dumps. And, and look, this is the, if you take nothing else away from this, you know, this talk, this is, this is where to, this is really where it's at, right? We're at a digital forensics conference anyway, uh, so certainly this makes for, uh, makes for some apt, uh, apt discussions. Um, I want to talk about uh, a couple of notes here, right? I don't want to talk about how the equation group may or may not abuse the tools we're going to discuss. Uh, because I think that's probably not a, uh, not a rocket science move there. I think that leaves uh, me and little bracelets at the back here. Um, but uh, <clears throat> I do want to highlight capabilities that have been released, and every one of these are capabilities that other people have talked about publicly, right, um, and inside the dumps. Um, and I want to talk about how this should force us to fundamentally change what we believe to be both in the realm of the possible and the realm of the reasonably likely, right? Because when folks come out and they say, what's in the realm of the possible? Yesterday, uh, somebody asked Nicole uh, Ibrahim, who did the, the awesome event trace, uh, event trace logging and ETL stuff, they asked, hey, could somebody edit that stuff? And, and in the back, I'm thinking, wow, come on, man, of course they can, right? But, but then again, I'm thinking, now that's in the realm of the possible. What's in the realm of the reasonably likely? Would an attacker do that? And secondarily, if they did it, what forensic traces would it leave, right? So as we start talking about this stuff here, I wanna highlight that, again, we're just looking at capabilities. Now, from a should you do this, should you be analyzing leaks, right? Obviously, if you work government stuff, this is, eh, right, a little third rail kind of stuff, right? Um, I wanna come back and tell you that we have seen already, it took two months, not for Eternal Blue, took two months for the actual event log editing code to start showing up in malware. I'm sure it happened quicker than that, we just saw the first sample two months in, right? And you can go in and I can use the Yara signature and I can look at specifically the list of API calls made and the way that they're made, and it is the code, right? So two months is what it took, right? So as we step back here, if you're not looking at this stuff, let me go ahead and, and tell you that your attackers are, your adversaries are. And the interesting thing is, most digital forensics professionals that I talk to, most infosec professionals, they wanna look at these dumps. And the people telling them not to, it's the bosses, right? And the irony is, it's always the boss, it's always the manager who comes in and like, it's APT that's attacking us, right? And I'm like, yes, absolutely, they're advanced. They're advanced persistent threat. I always like when somebody says APT to say, what does that stand for? And oftentimes they don't know, that's the cool part. Uh, but I like to come back then and break it down for them. We say APT, I like to walk them through that, and here I wanna focus on the A, right? The advanced piece. Because I want you to, I wanna ask the question, do you think your attackers are so advanced that they're compromising your network? but they're also not advanced enough to download a dump from the internet and analyze it? And if they know about these capabilities, shouldn't you? And they're like, well, ha ha, armed with that logic, I can tell you nothing but don't look at the dumps. Wait, what? No, right? So again, as we start talking about this stuff, it is important for you to understand the capabilities. Between this and the Vault 7 dumps, every nation state attack group on the planet is looking at these, and they are leaps and bounds. They're learning from tens to hundreds of millions of dollars in research, uh, paid for presumably, again, I'm not gonna confirm or deny anything, but paid for presumably with your tax dollars, right? You should absolutely be benefiting from this. So I wanna talk about five deeper implications, and there are way more than this, right? I would ask by show of hands how many people have actually analyzed the dumps, but I totally don't wanna put any of you in a bad position, right? Either for raising your hand or not raising your hand. 
but I'm gonna tell you there's a ton more in this that folks have talked about publicly. Uh, again, I wanna focus on these five, threat hunting the equation group actors. Uh, an equation group is the Kaspersky name for what was released in the shadow brokers dumps. Uh, the disable auditing piece, so I wanna talk about event log editing, hacking Oracle, uh, and then <coughs> threat hunting other actors uh, in networks. So <coughs> threat hunting the equation group. Uh, this is one where I would step back as we talk about, uh, start talking about the, <coughs> excuse me, start talking about uh, our courses of action in threat intelligence or courses of action incident response, we talk about both detection and discovery. Detection is basically getting a signature, right, and dropping that signature in, let's say, on your IDS uh, and waiting for a hit. And then there's discovery, and that's post hoc signature use. That's the, we didn't know this IP address was bad or compromised yesterday when we actually had a connection to it, but can I go back in my logs? Can I go back in my NetFlow, my PCAP? What about tool signatures, file names, registry keys, service names, right? And I know a lot of folks are like, yeah, but totally they would have cleaned that stuff up once they knew it was compromised. And, and I have to say maybe, right? But I'll tell you, when we're doing incident response, we find machines where somebody's pulled a hard drive out of a machine for e-discovery or litigation reasons or some box buried in the back somewhere. And, and if it was off, nobody could touch that, right? So there's a possibility that there's stuff there. And we find threat actors in some of those weird machines there applying stuff we know about today that they wouldn't have known when they pulled the drive out on the machine three years ago. Somebody wouldn't have known to look for it, even though they've analyzed it. Again, we have new data today. And again, the equation group stuff, again, you have new data today. Now, I hope the majority of the folks sitting in the room today were not targets of the equation group, uh, but I mean, who knows, right? So, <clears throat> oh, by the way, before we, uh, before we leave that, it's not just the equation group at this point. Now everybody has the tools. So I'll just throw that one out there too. Uh, certainly might make it worth uh, looking for that as well. We talk about disabling auditing, because this is where stuff actually starts getting sexy, right? Uh, traditionally, we've been told that if you turn event log, at, or sorry, event uh, auditing off, there's always gonna be an audit change record in the event log itself. And we know uh, that from their own documentation, no less, right? Um, we know that uh, attackers can disable event logging. And presumably, this doesn't leave any additional audit logs. And I can tell you from having reverse engineered the code, that is absolutely the case. Right? I do a little bit of reverse engineering here and there. Uh, it turns out that these, uh, these guys actually jump into, and this was released in January, and again, we first saw it operationalized in March. Um, <clears throat> what was happening here effectively is that these guys are jumping in to the, uh, basically jumping in uh, to the LSAS process, injecting into the LSAS process. They're hunting down the specific thread that does event logging. And you gotta, I mean, I gotta fist bump the attackers here, right? The developer that came up with this, this is, it's both simplistic and it's amazing, right? Because they step back and they say, okay, look, we're gonna go into memory and we're gonna find of all the threads in LSAS, and there are a lot. If you're not sure, pop, pop up in Process Hacker sometime and look at the threads in LSAS. That is a busy freaking process, right? And so <clears throat> we got these threads all going in LSAS. They hunt down the specific thread that does event logging and they just suspend it. And that's it, right? So happily, your event logging doesn't do anything. It doesn't know that it's been suspended. By the way, cool fact, uh, it turns out messages don't queue up on the backside, right? So all that event logging that was supposed to happen, that all falls on the floor. And eventually they just unsuspend and resume the thread when they're done and go, go, go. And I'd love to tell you this is a new thing, but I think it's not, right? Uh, because the script that they use to deploy the DLL, right, uh, shows that it was created in uh, 01. I checked my watch this morning, it's 2018, right? So people have had this for a long time. As a matter of fact, I have to throw something at Rob here because I was, I was sold a bag of lies when I took 508, right? We started talking about, and I'm rolling back here six or seven years, right? I mean, Rob, what the heck, man? Anyway, I was told that event logging, right? Event logging, if they were turned it off, we would absolutely see an event record there and no such event record apparently exists. So again, and I'm not picking on Rob here, obviously this is like full nation state capability. And we've seen other folks start to go in and delete logs before. I've never seen this capability anywhere else, right? So, so we start reverse engineering this. This is something to start thinking about because I depend on event logs, right? And today the game's changed a little bit, right? Where I'm really having to step back and start doing, and I'll talk more about this in a minute, hunting the negative space, right? Because as I start hunting the negative space, I've gotta ask what should be there based on all the stuff that I know, right? Whether it's ETL, whether it's prefetch, whether it's shim cache, am cache, other evidence of execution, based on what I know must be there, what isn't in the event log? Before, I used to open up the event log and I'm like, hey, what's in the event log? Now I've gotta ask myself what's in the event log and what's not in the event log. And what's not in the event log is possibly, and in many cases, 
every bit as important as what actually is. So we find out not only can the attackers suspend the event log or suspend auditing, they can also surgically edit event records, right? So presumably this is the kind of thing where before you got on the box to inject or before you elevated or whatever uh, privilege escalated to get into LSAS, again, what logs did you leave there, right? Now we had some evidence previously that a couple of APT groups uh, had this capability. Uh, normally, again, we would find this not by looking at the tools, right? Because usually they, they had great OPSEC and they took their tools with them. Uh, didn't leave them on disk here, and they did usually secure deletes. Uh, but we would see stuff like, for instance, a 4625 with no 4624. Or if process auditing was on, right? We would see the actual session ID, and there was no log on session ID. And I love those, right? That's one of those. And again, I know at that point that I've got an attacker who has an event log editing capability, but also doesn't know how event logging works, right? Or has a partial understanding of it, because they're like, let me go ahead and nuke my log on. And I'm like, cool, right? But you totally screwed up nuking your log off. Right? And the fact that you have a log off with no log on certainly is super suspicious, right? So again, what we're looking here is, uh, <clears throat> we're looking basically what we call hunting that negative space, right? We're looking at what must, what must be here, right? I talked to an engineer several years ago, it's probably actually a decade and a half ago, and uh, he's one of those folks that made one of these generational leaps in, uh, <clears throat> generational leaps in, in technology. And I won't get into what it is because it doesn't really matter for this, but he talked to me a lot and taught me about hunting the negative space. And he was talking about, uh, you know, while everybody else, he said he made his big breakthrough actually at the, uh, uh, what do they call that, the, uh, the big pool up there in Washington, D.C., right, uh, right in front of the Washington Monument, the reflecting pool. He was out in the reflecting pool and he said there were some ducks there, right, and he said he was watching the ducks, he was watching people feed the ducks. And he said the ducks that were looking for the bread hitting the water never got the bread. He said if the duck had to wait to see the bread, right, see the bread hitting the water, he said they never got the bread. He said he was watching the ducks, and he said every time bread hit the water, it caused a little ripple. And he said the ducks would immediately, he said that smart ducks would immediately dive, right? Because they weren't looking for the bread, they were looking for what was caused by the bread, and that was that little disruption in the water. And they were triangulating based on the disruptions to go figure out where the bread had hit. And that's one of those spots where you gotta step back and go first off, this guy's clearly playing Beautiful Mind Home Edition, right? But secondarily, right, this hunting the negative space, is, it's a really interesting piece, and we can certainly use it for forensics and more aptly for anti-forensics. This is another big one for me, because a lot of folks are doing table and column level encryption, and we regularly have this fight with, I say fight, this argument when we start doing red team, and we get onto a database server, and we're system level permissions, and folks say, hey, did you actually steal the data? And we're like, no, because it's a production database and we don't have the credentials, right? But we're system level, but we don't actually have the login, for instance, the Oracle login. We don't have that Oracle login, right? Is that cool? And they're like, I'm not gonna go start injecting to somebody's production Oracle database server for obvious reasons. I don't wanna you know, cause, a, uh, cause an availability issue. People are like, well, then I guess you, you couldn't really get into it. I'm like, no, no, we're system. We, we totally could if we engineered the tools. And it turns out somebody did, right? So there's actually a tool built into the shadow brokers dumps or a tool that's in the shadow brokers dumps Matt Suisse, uh, who stood me up here, uh, talked about this at Black Hat last year. You can go download his video. He talked a lot about this, actually, because it's involved heavily in the Swift, uh, the Swift dumps that were talked about there. Uh, there's no logging. Uh, bypasses any of that table and column level encryption because you are the database. So as long as the database has the keys, you're good to go, right? As long as that database process, and that's kind of the way the column and table level encryption normally work, even if you're using a hardware security module, an HSM, it's usually the database that makes the call to the HSM, so game on. So again, we kind of step back here and look at this as yet another capability. And by the way, again, dive into these dumps because there's a ton of other stuff in there uh, that uh, the folks have pulled out. But I think the most interesting part is threat hunting other nation state actors. Hungarian researchers disclosed earlier this year that there was a program or a set of files that they called territorial dispute. And they talk about enabling the equation group to go hunt for other nation state actors. Meaning in the shadow brokers dumps, right, there are a bunch of IOCs that the shadow broker, or sorry, not shadow broker, excuse me, the equation group themselves had built to go detect their adversaries, right? So counterintelligence. And largely, we're not using this. In fact, it took almost a year, I think it was March, uh, March of this year, and the dump was created, or dump was uh, released, April of last year, right? So we're looking at 11 months-ish uh, between the time that the dump was publicly available and somebody called this out. I have no doubt that other folks found this without reporting on it. But what you have now effectively is a ton of government IOCs, government built indicators of compromise, uh, to target other groups. The really cool part is we can confirm, uh, based on some publicly known IOCs already, we can confirm that some of those IOCs match up with a couple of nation state threat groups, and so you can infer that the rest of them also do 
We just didn't know about them, right? So <clears throat> free beer, right? Um, I'll talk quickly about uh, kind of living in the shadows of, of that disclosure because, you know, there was a lot here that I really didn't know how this was all going to play out, right? I'll tell you that if you'd asked me prior to April what I thought was going to happen if, for instance, a Russian intelligence, sorry, excuse me, a hostile nation, no, a anonymous group that's dumping stuff on the internet, if you asked me, you know, what was going to happen when they did that and when they called you out as a former NSA hacker and, and caveat uh, here also spoke in enough code, we'll say, for me to kind of a, hey, we know and we want to make sure that you know that, that we know kind of thing. Uh, if I, you know, if you'd asked me how I thought that was going to play out, I absolutely thought, and in fact notified Sands, I said it will not surprise me, because I'm teaching, right, so it will not surprise me if, if the FBI shows up here, right, and, and pulls me in for questioning and the whole, you know, whatever. I, I just, I don't know how it's going to play out, right, or, you know, again, who knows, right. Um, my threat model absolutely changed overnight, right, so um, I, I will tell you that if you're working in government today, understand your threat model, because I'll tell you absolutely I did not. Um, nothing stays secret forever, right. Uh, between different uh, different organizations, uh, I spent uh, gosh almost two decades in almost two decades in intelligence. Um, and today, what's changing is that intelligence community leaks and compromises are absolutely rampant. Uh, before you do it, whatever it is, think about how that would look if your actions were suddenly on the front page of the New York Times, for instance. Right. Um, so, <clears throat> by the way, that was an absolutely wild uh, wild event. The New York Times came down and they wanted to talk about the shadow brokers a little bit, and they wanted to cover it from the perspective of you know, again, take a little bit of a look at, uh, you know, what was it like after, after getting outed. Um, and that was kind of interesting, and, and they actually ran this story, this is another SANS Summit, actually, uh, the <coughs> Hackfest last year, and they ran the story in digital form on Sunday, right, and of course, you know, again, Twitter mentions blowing up and everything, and I didn't think it was going to go in print at all, and I walked in Starbucks Monday morning, and, uh, you know, of course, Starbucks in D.C. there has all the papers from, you know, the major papers there, and I I look, and I'm on the front page above the fold of the New York Times, right? So my photo's there, and I'm like, oh, wow, okay, that's interesting. And how do you not buy one of those, I guess? So I go ahead and grab a paper, right, and put it down there with my coffee, and uh, the barista who's bringing it up looks down, looks up, looks down, looks up. She's like, that's you. I'm like, it is. She's like, what'd you do? I'm like, never mind, right? Just <laughs> bring up the coffee. We'll just roll there, right? So, um, but that was truly a surreal experience, right? So, and I hope it never happens again. Um, look, uh, you know, from a... <clears throat> From a threat model standpoint, and understanding your threat model, right? I assume that what I did was never going to be detected, right? Because, well, we're pretty good at that. Um, if it was detected, it wouldn't be attributed to the U.S. And if it was attributed to the U.S., it wasn't going to be attributed to me. And I'm positive that none of those are true now. Right? I'm positive that none of those are true now. I've already restricted a lot of my travel, a lot of my travel, um, and I expect that that will continue to uh, continue to restrict quite a bit, right? And by the way, it's not just about where you're traveling to, it's where you're connecting through. Uh, that's certainly a concern. And I'll tell you another one that hit me uh, last year, and I'll leave some of the countries out because it doesn't really matter. It's where are you flying over? Because we had one of those, uh, we'll say a little engine issue, right? Where you ever been on a plane, right? You're 35,000 feet flying along, and all of a sudden you hear that clunk, right? And you know when you hit 10,000 feet, they do the ding, ding. There's a three ding one, and that's the flight attendants prepare for an emergency, right? And they did the ding, 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 and I'm like, oh. And in my in-flight entertainment system, I look over at the map, and I'm like, oh, well, that's going to suck, right? Because then I'm looking at, very seriously, if we land, do I take back off, right? Um, I have since started looking. I, I know more about flight routes, I bet, than any non-pilot or non-airline industry person. I travel internationally a lot. Uh, I know a lot about flight routes at this point, and I'll just leave it there, right? Because there's countries that I won't fly over either. We didn't land, thankfully, right? It was one of those, they're like, whew, everything's good now, right? And the seatbelt sign went on, eventually we're good. But again, this is one of these pieces here, is you're doing this work, uh, if you're in this, uh, in this kind of field, I would say stop assuming, uh, like I did originally, uh, that, uh, again, stuff's never going to be attributed to you. Um, I am positive the shadow brokers have a heck of a lot more data than they, uh, <clears throat> a heck of a lot more data than they've already released. I'm positive that they can tie specific operations back to me. I uh, have zero doubt in my mind that they can do that. Uh, and that's going to be a really, really bad day when that happens, especially with the DOJ charging uh, other foreign hackers, right? Uh, what goes around comes around, right? Uh, so again, you know, I mentioned uh, <clears throat> some changing of travel plans. Shadow brokers got really, really mad at me in July 2017. Um, they actually called out another uh, NSA professional who they thought was harassing them, or ex-NSA professional, who they thought was ha uh, harassing them on Twitter. 
Um, and it turns out they totally got it wrong, right? Uh, so the guy shared a name, the Twitter handle, right? Shared a name with somebody who was actually uh, an ex-NSA uh, ex -NSA hacker. Um, and uh, the guy uh, who was behind the Twitter account actually came out and said, hey brother, you're totally wrong. How do you know? Because I'm this guy, right? And you totally pinned the wrong people. And then as a cover move, uh, they basically tore into me and Madigan, right? So that was awesome. Uh, they came right back and they're like, we knew all the whole, the whole time you weren't that guy. And, but you know who we got right? Jake, right? And I'm like, really? Thanks. Um, so that sucked, right? Uh, so I actually had to cancel a couple of overseas engagements because again, uh, you know, there's the what you know they've released and then there's the stuff that you know you did, but you don't know that they've released that to other governments and you can imagine. Anyway, it's a heck of a lot harder to understand the threat of a disclosure made privately to a foreign government, right? I think that's all the time I got. I appreciate everybody here, uh, definitely, uh, you know, for, for listening to this. And uh, I hope if you take nothing else away, man, it's, it's the dumps. You gotta look at these dumps, because your attackers are too, 100%, and they are repurposing these tools at an amazing rate, and you're absolutely gonna seize your networks. We saw the event log editing capability used in a university network where a student hacked the network and edited event logs. Forget nation states, man, we're talking undergrad students. Anyway, thanks. <laughs>